He claims to have hit a further 200 Hamas targets in overnight bombing. You cannot turn on your phone or go on TV without seeing news about Hamas, Israel. Israel is most certainly not an apartheid state. Arab citizens of Israel have the same rights as Jewish citizens. Who owned this land before? What happened pre-1948? Who started what and who's really at fault? Is this a huge middle finger to the United States and Israel? Hamas's call for a day of rage appears to be living up to its name. With tensions escalating in the war between Israel and Hamas, surely no no one will be cynical enough to exploit this situation in order to make a profit. People who support either sides completely remove their humanity in order to do so, which I don't think is necessary. If you didn't think a world war was possible before all bets are off, get ready. ideas have consequences. Um, delighted you're here with us today. Let me say, oh, and by the way, welcome to the posse. It's been a lot of fun engaging you as best I can on Twitter and on YouTube. You know, something interesting I've discovered is that the Twitter and the YouTube crowds are very different. There's a little bit of overlap, but they are very different audiences. And that's been, uh, that's been very interesting. And I wanna encourage the posse Make sure that you not just hit that notification button, uh, but we're discovering that a lot of you are saying you're not getting notifications about when the next podcast is going to drop and things of that nature. Be sure to subscribe to the email list. The email list is a way to cir uh, um, circumvent that so that we can notify you even when uh, YouTube does not. And I also want to say good morning to the full Ideas Have Consequences team. We have a group of people here. We have people in Dallas who are at the very same time playing a role in bringing this to you this morning. Now, why are we doing these episodes live? Well, the reason for that is because everything that is going on in the Israel-Hamas war, and that is what we're discussing again today, is moving so rapidly that our feeling was that if we were to record this and then show it, you know, say several days later, something might have changed rather dramatically. And we wanted to make sure that we got the information out to you just as quickly as possible. I... Uh, I think that today what we're going to do is jump right into the questions. But before we do that, um, I, I want to, to talk a little bit about something that I find very unsettling that I'm seeing more and more of on social media, and that is Holocaust denial. When early in my you know, very minor academic career, I was awarded a fellowship, um, a kind of um, Fulbright for teachers that sent me overseas to um, research the intellectual origins of the Holocaust. And now this is kind of a big deal to be awarded this. And uh, I uh, planned out my entire you know, research project and where I would go and what I would do. But it sent me at least initially to several of the former concentration camps, you know, that played a key role in the Holocaust, places like Auschwitz and Dachau and Middlebaugh Dora, and, uh, which is where, by the way, um, the Aggregate 4 rocket, also known as a V2, was um, largely produced, and uh, Buchenwald and various, uh, uh, Mauthausen in, in Austria, various other places like that. And, um, you know, there were many things that I learned as a result of that research. One certainly was the fact that the German people were very eager to forget this. Now, this is this is back in the '90s, and I've since been I've since been back to some of these places several times. In fact, uh, I think it was just last year, or the year before, I was at um, I was at Dachau again. But the German people were eager to forget them. And so what I learned to do was when I was asking, you know, for directions to a place, I would often just give, you know, say an address as opposed to a name. So when I was in Nuremberg, I was wanting to go to the site of the Nazi rallies and I would, you know, give, give an address and say, hey, do you know where this is, where this street corner is? And you would see people stiffen, you know, maybe a, a concierge in a hotel and say, you want to see the place of the Nazi rallies. Um, well, yeah, yeah, that's where I'm headed. Well, you do know there's more to see in Germany than that, don't you? Yeah, I, I do know that, but I'm here for a research. I mean, people become a little bit offended. 
uh, by that. I also recall a conversation with a German woman who was <laughs> turned out an out-and-out -out Nazi. I mean, she was, she was, um, had been a nurse during the, uh, the Second World War, and I found myself in this very interesting conversation with her, and it led to her minimizing um, the Holocaust and, you know, basically saying it didn't really happen. Holocaust denial is actually against the law in 16 European countries. We can debate whether or not it should be against the law. My own particular feeling is that it should not be. I mean, I believe in free speech. I believe the kooks should be able to say what they want to say. That said, Holocaust denial is a very serious thing and it's playing a key role in this war because I am seeing all over social media, um, first of all, just out and out Holocaust denial, but I'm also seeing a more subtle form of Holocaust denial. And it takes the role of people saying, well, you know, um, they obfuscate. They they say, well, it, it's it's probably exaggerated at the number of people who were killed. So instead of saying six and a half million Jews, hey, what is it? Five million Jews? Four million Jews? You know, this kind of thing. But you also discover that there are, um, you know, quote NBC News. NBC News headlines survey finds quote shocking lack of Holocaust knowledge among millennials and Gen Zers. Now, I frankly don't find that shocking because they're being poorly educated. Um, they're not being taught history, uh, certainly not being taught um, that history. They're being taught very little history of Western civilization. They're just generally just being indoctrinated, not educated. Uh, I saw that Victor Davis Hanson tweeted, I think, yesterday that a college education simply was no longer worth it because you were, you know, graduating with, with a massive amount of debt and you really weren't getting much in exchange for it. Well, I don't think that's new. I think that's been true for, for quite some time. My own engagement, which is substantial with college students, has found that over the last Oh, two decades used to, um, when I would speak on a college campus, I would engage a lot of, let's say, um, uh, liberals, left, left leaning individuals, but with education, with arguments. And you, you give a presentation and there are mics set up around the room and you can see them, you know, getting angry and lining up behind the mics, getting ready to take you on. Um, that's fine. You know, fight me. I can take it. I, uh, I didn't mind the the exchanges like that. These days, though, it's very different. They're not wanting to argue with you anymore. Uh, or rather, they just want to shut you down. They want to prevent you from speaking at all. If you're coming to their campus, they don't want you coming to their campus. They want to prevent you from speaking. When you are speaking, they want to distract. They want to uh, ridicule. They want to shut you down. Um, it's emotion. It's not argument. And so it is when it comes to things like the Holocaust. There are... Um, I believe when this war began, and and by the way, it's it's worth stating this. You know, there is the long-standing anti-Semitic trope that the Jews control media, that they control media. <laughs> I'm not seeing that. Uh, indeed, I suspect that there are is massive amounts of Arab oil money that is flowing into the West and is influencing our media in very unhealthy ways. Uh, much in the same way, if you watched an earlier podcast we did about Bill Gates, I demonstrated to you on that podcast how Bill Gates gets favorable media coverage. And it is because he is giving um, hundreds of millions of dollars to media organizations. And as Jacobin Magazine, which is about as left-leaning as it gets, has pointed out, there's a lot of dark money, money that cannot be tracked, that he undoubtedly is giving to media in order to get the favorable coverage. Well, much of the same is happening with Arab oil money, and certainly with um, organizations like, let's, let's just say, Al Jazeera, with whom I have, have done work, and um, meaning I've never worked for them. I've appeared on that network. And Al Jazeera you know, has, a, has an objective that's quite obvious. I mean, it is anti-Semitic in its core. But the idea of undermining the Holocaust, why, why would... Um, pro-Arab 
um, organizations, why would they want to do that? What would be Hamas's goal in doing that? What would be Iran's goal in doing that? How, um, Hezbollah and various others. Why would they be interested in undermining the Holocaust narrative? Well, I think for, for um, the very obvious fact that if you can deny Israel victim status, if you can deny them um, the Holocaust narrative, of a persecuted people who founded their nation with Western support in 1948, then you can deny them legitimacy. You can deny them support that they're getting from the West. And that is because after World War II, Western nations, eager to demonstrate that they were not the monsters that the Allies believed them to be. So um, uh, let's say, obviously, Germany but also countries that collaborated with the Nazis quite gleefully. France, for instance, which I believe rounded up uh, the Malice, which was a, um, a French equivalent of the Gestapo, kind of gleefully uh, rounded up roughly 800,000 Jews and sent them by train you know, to the aforementioned concentration camps. And after World War II, those countries um, seeking to be rehabilitated to the community of nations also sought to demonstrate we're not monsters, we're not anti-Semites. And the result of which was that those countries, for them to support Arab claims over Jewish claims uh, in Palestine uh, was just simply unthinkable. It was absolutely unthinkable. And therefore, they have generally been very supportive of Israel, but that is changing, and it's changing in a big way, and it's changing in a way that, quite frankly, I find frightening, and it is for three reasons. The first reason is the obvious fact that there are very few Holocaust survivors still alive. I mean, here we are these many decades later, and they are obviously dying. Um, I have known um, several of them. It has been my privilege to interview them, and uh, I find denial of the Holocaust um, to be, I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're on my, if you follow me on Twitter, if you are subscribed to this YouTube channel and you're a Holocaust denier, unsubscribe, go away. You, you are a monster. You, you are a monster. I've been to these places. I'm here to tell you that it's real, that it's a fact, that it happened. And my own feeling is that people like you, you can't reason with people like you. And that is because you're, your prejudicial commitments outweigh your intellectual honesty. You are not willing. You are not willing to see facts. You don't want to see facts. You simply don't care. Uh, uh, several years ago, I was at a lunch where um, a man joined us, and uh, he was asking me where I'd recently been, and I told him I'd just been in Germany, and that I had been to, um, to Dachau. And um, anyway, he started with this very devious argument to deny that the Holocaust had ever happened. I was absolutely a astonished and blown away. And I have never met a Holocaust denier who wasn't an anti-Semite. Some of them try to pretend they're not, but they are. They absolutely are. They are Jew haters. And Holocaust denial finds its, its greatest support in Arab communities and in Persian ones. The... Um, the Iranians. Iranians are not Arabs. They are they are Persians. They are they are not Arabs. But Holocaust denial finds a lot of support in those communities, and that is because very frequently you find the greatest number of people who are anti-Semites in those groups. But as I say, support for Israel is is going to disappear from Europe. And it is for three reasons. The first is the obvious fact, as I say, that um, there are very few Holocaust survivors left. The second is the massive influx of Muslims into Europe. There's a massive millions of Muslims are pouring into Europe, and it hasn't gone unnoticed by the politicians who have en engineered it in the first place. Israel must anticipate that its support from Europe will evaporate within a generation, I believe. And then the third reason, which I've already mentioned, is that Arab and Iranian oil money is pouring into the West and influencing both education and media. 
Um, so Holocaust denial is becoming much more prevalent. And when this war began with Hamas, you began to see influencers, probably paid influencers on social media, bots and media all begin to question the um, Holocaust narrative. And the way they do it is Holocaust, Holocaust denial relies on a strategy that is very similar to that that is employed by abortionists to obfuscate, to minimize, and to relativize. Um, and so the result of that is to try to draw your attention away from the facts. They certainly don't want to see pictures. I don't know if any of you will remember this, but maybe about, gosh, how long has it been? Maybe about 30 years ago when Operation Rescue um, was in full swing, which was an effort to bring attention to what was taking place at abortion clinics. And about Operation Rescue, they would, they would gather it, you know, at at abortion clinics, not violently, not seeking to burn them down, anything of that nature. And of course, now you have federal law that says you can't do this. But they were trying to convince women, do not kill your child. And one of the things that Operation Rescue did is they, their protesters, their pro-life protesters would often have photographs on their signage of aborted children. And the left went apoplectic over this apoplectic over this. They hated this. And I think they hated it because it was to be confronted with, with the disgusting nature of their own sin. It was to be confronted with their own evil. They didn't want to see what they were doing. They didn't want anybody else to see what they were doing. They wanted to speak of it in terms of statistics, in terms of um, uh, health care, uh, and speak of it very clinically is just like wart removal. And it's hard to discuss it as wart removal when somebody is standing right there with a picture of an aborted child whose limbs have been completely torn apart. This is much the way that Holocaust deniers work. They, they are offended by the pictures of the Holocaust. They are offended to hear the data. They are offended to hear the testimony of Holocaust survivors. They don't want to hear that. They want to reduce it to um, a, um, a very questionable use of data. Now, all of that said, I just want you to be very aware of what's happening when you're seeing this on social media. Why is somebody bringing up the Holocaust right now? Because they are trying, they're trying to erode Israel's place occupying the moral high ground and their legitimacy as a people and as a nation. Now, let's begin with the questions. Good morning, Larry. Um, we've got some viewers here that want to know what is Iran's role in this? What is Iran's role in all of this? You know, it's interesting to me um, to watch what Iran is doing. I believe that Iran is using uh, Hamas much the same way that the United States is using Ukraine against Russia. We don't want to fight the Russians directly, so let's, let's give weapons, let's give money to the Ukrainians and let them go and poke the bear. Let's let their boys go and, and die fighting the Russians. We'll, we'll, we'll fight the war by proxy. Iran is fighting the war by proxy against uh, Israel. But I also have wondered, because Hamas, Hamas isn't stupid. They did not launch this war expecting to win this war. And to be clear, they really don't want a war. They want terrorism. And I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a distinction between the two. They know that they can't win a conventional war with Israel. What they want to do is terrorize. They, they want to do the very kinds of things that they've been doing throughout their history. And that is to terrorize, to rape, to pillage, um, to bring about absolute chaos um, among the Jews, among the Israelis. This is, this is what they want to do. So they didn't launch this, this uh, campaign expecting to win a, a, a conventional war. I've wondered if they have done this, uh, if the Iranians have encouraged them to do it, to test Israel's Iron Dome, to test, uh, test their um, Iron Dome defenses. And also, is it, and I'm just asking because I don't know, None of us know the answer to this. 
we have to wait and see. Is this also a diversionary tactic um, for another attack, a larger attack that might come from Hezbollah in the north in Lebanon? And Hezbollah, by the way, is much more uh, dangerous than is Hamas. They're much better armed. Uh, they have much, much greater um, ability to project power. And is, is what Hamas doing, is it a diversionary tactic so that Hamas can, excuse me, so that Hezbollah can attack from the north or so that the Iranians can attack, a con, um, excuse me, launch a conventional attack against Israel? I don't know. I certainly hope not, because if that is the case, then we are looking at potentially World War III. But I do think that there's a possibility. I mean, we have to ask the question, why would Hamas do this when they know they can't win? Why would they do it? Is it just because their leaders are stupid? They're not stupid. I also think, if that's not the case, a diversionary tactic to allow Hezbollah to attack in, in, in the north or to the east to allow the Iranians to attack, is it an effort to do what I was just talking about, um, to turn the tables on the Israelis who have maintained a victim status, a global sympathy because of the Holocaust, is it an effort to provoke Israel with uh, these terrorist attacks, knowing full well that Benjamin Netanyahu, who is kind of the Trump of of Israel. He's, he's iron-fisted. He's tough. He's not a guy to be pushed around. He's a, he's a former commando. His brother was killed at Entebbe. I mean, uh, the Entebbe raid, if you know anything, uh, if you know anything about that, I mean, Benjamin Netanyahu is, he's a bit of a badass. And you would think, well, wouldn't, wouldn't Hamas prefer to attack when you've got a Biden-like figure? Well, no, not if their goal was to provoke Israel to a, a, um, um, a violent response against Hamas so that they could turn around and um, th record those images. And you remember what the woman said, uh, the people at Hamas, make sure that you turn your camera sideways and film those and upload them on uh, social media in order to say, look at what the Jews did. Look at what they did. Look at them. They're the terrorists. We're the victims. So I'm not sure that part of what Hamas has wanted here is to so provoke Israel that what they got was a, um, a violent response that they could use to change the victim narrative. Listen, the, the Arabs are, are uh, one of their primary strategies has been to deny Israel, to change the narrative that Israel is uh, that it is the victim in this war. And Israel is the victim in this war. It's not to say there aren't Palestinian victims. There certainly are. Um, we know that according to polls, 50% of Palestinians support Hamas. Well, that means 50% don't. But I don't think we should, we should read that other 50% as saying they're pro-Israeli uh, or they're not anti-Semitic. It just means that perhaps they're pro-Hezbollah, they're pro-Iranian, or they're, they're um, you know, pro-PLO, or pro-Palestinian Authority, or pro-Fatah, or something of that nature. So, don't know, but, um, but I've wondered what the larger strategy is here, and it seems to me that those are the more likely possibilities. Next question. Uh, why can't Israel make peace with Hamas? Why can't Israel make peace with... And by the way, let, let me go back to the previous question about Iran's war, excuse me, Iran's um, motives and all this. This is an interesting little, you know, in some of my research, a uh, very interesting little uh, quotation here. Cairo Radio in 1957 said this, the Palestinian refugees are the cornerstone in the Arab struggle against Israel. The refugees are the armaments of the Arab, uh, excuse me, the refugees are the armaments of the Arabs and Arab nationalism. Let me repeat that. Cairo Radio, the Palestinian refugees are the cornerstone in the Arab struggle against Israel. The Palestinians are between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, they are at war with Israel. On the other, 
If you think the, the Iranians care anything for the Palestinians, they don't. They see them as the cornerstone in their struggle against the Israelis. And it is because they can use them. They can use them in a proxy war. No one wants the Palestinians. You would think, well, um, surely... Surely Egypt will open their border to them. I mean, Gaza Strip, again, Gaza Strip is about 25 miles long and about seven miles wide. It is, bordered, it is bordered to the west by the Mediterranean, to the north by Israel, to the east by Israel, and to the south by Egypt. Has Egypt, their fellow Arabs, have they opened the border to the Palestinians? Absolutely not. They do not want them. Does Syria want them? No. Does Lebanon want them? No. Does Jordan want them? No, nobody wants them. So they're hemmed in. What they are is a useful tool for all Arabs and the Iranians against the Israelis. That's what they are. And that's the way they're being used. So they're being very, used very cynically by their own people. And they're being used very cynically by Hamas. I, I'm not sure that uh, how many in the audience saw this interview, and unfortunately I can't remember his name, but a... Um, a former member of Hamas, a man who grew up in, um, I'm not sure if it was West Bank or um, Gaza Strip, but he's very familiar with Hamas. Uh, he himself is a Palestinian, and he says Hamas doesn't care anything for the Palestinians. They care nothing for the Palestinians. They want to use the Palestinians for their own cynical purposes against Israel. So there are many Palestinians who are suffering because of the stupidity of their own leaders because of the evil of their own leaders. Now, I'm sorry, repeat your question to me again. Why can't they, why can't they uh, negotiate with Hamas? Reason, the reason Israel cannot would be very unwise to um, negotiate with Hamas is because Hamas, unlike the PLO, unlike the PA, the Palestinian Authority, unlike Fatah, um, they have never acknowledged Israel's right to exist. They've never acknowledged is Israel's right to exist. And um, the result of that uh, is that, as Paul Johnson says in his book that I think I have sitting right here, The History of the Jews, he says, for the Arabs, armistice is the continuation of war by other means. Hence, in a real sense, Israel has been at war with most of her Arab neighbors from November 1947 until this very day. For Hamas, any any ceasefire is just seen as a, um, a breather, an opportunity to regroup, to attack yet again. So peace in this sense is no lasting peace. It is just a prelude to war because Hamas, again, is an organization that has never acknowledged Israel's right to exist. Their, what's their slogan? From river to sea. Think about that. From river to sea. From the Jordan River to the sea. Where is Israel? Between the Jordan River and the sea. So imagine that, that the United States, the United States is negotiating with a group that has, first of all, that's a terrorist um, organization, so you don't negotiate with terrorist organizations in the first place. But second of all, that we're sitting down to negotiate um, a surrender with the, um, the Germans after World War II, who, A, say, we do not acknowledge the United States' right to exist. Oh, and by the way, our slogan is from Atlantic to Pacific. From Atlantic to Pacific. Hamas does not recognize Israel's right to exist, so any peace with them is no peace at all. Hamas, and I'm making a distinction here between Hamas and Palestinians, for while, while all members of Hamas are pal Palestinians, not all Palestinians are, um, are members of Hamas. Hamas has to be destroyed. Israel must continue this war until Hamas is utterly eradicated. And some of you will say, well, why does that mean, um, why does that mean attacking the Gaza Strip? Because that's where they are. They're hiding among the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. They're hiding among the Palestinians in the West Bank. They're hiding uh, probably, some of them with Hamas, probably in Qatar, probably in Iran. Our, um, the, the Israelis simply do not have a choice here. Next question. What do you think Hamas's strategy is? Uh, I think it's, 
I, I think it is what I was just saying just a, just a few minutes ago. I, I think it's to test the Iron Dome, um, not so much for their own purposes, but for their master's purposes. Um, Iran. We want to we want to know we want to know how um, strong their defenses are. You guys launched some rockets in there. Let's let's see let's see if their Iron Dome is really iron or is it clay. And I imagine that Israel has been excuse me Iran has been somewhat encouraged to see that the Iron Dome wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. That's one thing. The other is possibly a diversionary tactic for an attack from the north, from Hezbollah, and from Iran to the east. And then what I certainly think is part of the strategy is, as we have said this morning, to provoke Israel to such a violent response that they can turn around and use that response against the Israelis. Look what they're doing to innocent people. This is what the Nazis did after World War II, during World War II. They tried to portray Churchill and FDR as terrorists. Look what they did to Dresden. Look what they did in bombing that city. Look at, look at what they did um, in bombing Berlin, all these innocent people who are killed. It, it was the, the narrative um, by America's enemies after the dropping of the atomic bombs, which absolutely should have been dropped. We addressed that on a podcast, oh, a couple of months ago when um, Oppenheimer came out. You can go back and take a look at that particular podcast, and we addressed that issue. But that's what's happening here. It's an effort as a, uh, to use it as this war as a propaganda tool. They know they can't win in a conventional war, but maybe they can win a propaganda war. And given all the bots and all the influencers, I, I'm seeing people on social media that I have followed and then I liked who are, are effectively, they keep saying, well, I'm not pro Hamas. No, you are. And you're probably an anti-Semite. Being against Israeli policy, by the way, here in Gaza doesn't make you an anti-Semite. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is this, some of the arguments that are being employed by, by those people who are pro-Palestinian, it starts creeping in that direction. It really does. Next question. Uh, you were talking about Hezbollah a minute ago coming from the north, and that brings the next question. Who are Hezbollah? Hezbollah operating out of Lebanon, Lebanon to the north. As I've said, they, they have um, much greater ability to project power. They're much bigger than Hamas. Um, they're founded, I think, in 83. Not, you know, they're not an ancient organization, but certainly um, Hamas, um, uh, their ideology certainly is, and that is because they are... Um, they're radical Muslims. You know, when we're talking about, in, in the previous podcast, I talked about the importance of Islam in this. Islam is incredibly important to all of this because while the Palestinian Authority, Fatah and the PLO, which are all basically the same organization, those are all secular. They're basically secular. That is not true of Hamas and it is not true of Hezbollah. And you got to understand the role that Islam plays here because Islam is by definition anti-Semitic. There's a reason, there's a reason why that is, is so and is driving their ideology in a big way. So Hezbollah is the one that we have to really be keeping an eye on to the north. What are they doing? Uh, they're certainly rejoicing in what Hamas is doing. They're rejoicing in the terrorist attacks. They're supportive of Hamas. But are they going to engage beyond just lobbing a few rockets as, um, as say, someone like Victor Davis Hansen has speculated, or are they going to try to get involved um, in a much more conventional way? Don't know the answer to that yet. But Hezbollah and Hamas are just different sides of the same coin, same ideology. Well, last week we had a couple people kind of ask this question, what is Zionism? Zionism, a few people brought this up last week, and Zionism is, is very important in all of um, this, in this particular discussion. Listen, the history of Zionism, which we don't have the time to get into today, we've got less than 30 minutes left, and I do want to take, I do want to take more questions, but I'll try to give you a little bit of a primer on that. Um, Zionism at its core is just the idea that 
the Jewish people should have their own state. The Jewish people should have their own state, and Zion being the hill in Jerusalem where the temple was built. So Zion, Zionism, it's the idea that the Jewish people should have their own state. And this picked up um, a lot of steam in the late 19th century, and that is because the Jewish people have been driven out, you know, they're driven out of Spain, they were driven out of Eastern Europe, uh, they're driven from country to country to country, and you began seeing um, anti-Semitism pick up steam in the 19th century. Once again, it has existed since time immemorial. But in Europe, um, it began picking up steam in the, uh, in the 19th century. And many Jews saw France as a place where they were accepted, a place where they could flourish. And after the, um, the Dreyfus affair, you can, uh, you can look this up, the, um, the Dreyfus affair. If you're familiar with the actor, Richard Dreyfus, um, he has done a documentary about this because the French army officer, uh, whose first name has gone out of my head, but anyway, the Dreyfus affair the, uh, was his relative, you know, um, you know, many generations back, and he was falsely accused. It was obvious to everyone that he was falsely accused um, of wrongdoing, and it was being driven in media and in the army by anti-Semitism. And uh, he ended up serving in a French penal colony, and it was it was jarring to many Jews because this this was this was January sixth to the tenth power because the evidence was overwhelmingly in Dreyfus's favor. Um, it was so obvious to onlookers throughout Europe, and in a lot of ways it was very embarrassing to the French because it was obviously driven by anti-Semitism. But it led many French Jews to feel that they had no home. There was no place to go. Um, and it was then, it was in the aftermath of that, that a man by the name of Theodore Herzl Theodore Herzl, who is kind of regarded as the founder of <clears throat> um, Zionism, began arguing that Jew the Jewish people needed their own home. And, and by the way, another example of this is Schindler's List. If you remember Schindler's List, there's a scene where, um, who's the guy who's playing M now? Ralph Fiennes. Ralph Fiennes plays, plays M in... Um, the Bond movies, well, he plays the really evil, you know, camp commandant. And you have this scene where German soldiers are gathered in a circle in Krakow, and they're about to begin the roundup of Jews in Krakow. And Ralph finds this Nazi officer, he walks into the center of this circle of all these German soldiers, and he is holding a scroll in his hand, and he begins to speak to them. And he says, 600 years ago, the Jews were invited into Poland, into Krakow. Um, and uh, Casimir III, the Polish king at the time, invited them here, and they flourished, he says. And for 600 years, they have flourished here. And then, he says, today, that history comes to an end. And then these officers, you know, go out and with their, their companies, regiments, battalions, they begin to exterminate the Jewish people of Krakow. And those that survive are um, sent to places like Auschwitz. Well, that kind of treatment of the Jewish people was um, relatively common. I mean, Alexander III, Alexander III of Russia, Tsar Alexander III, of Russia said this. He said, of the Jewish people, we will assimilate a third, we'll deport a third, we will kill a third. And that began in, uh, in 1881 in Russia. So the, the Jewish people began emigrating to the United Fiddler on the Roof. This is in part what Fiddler on the Roof is about. It's telling this story of these people driven from one place to another. And uh, it was in the aftermath of the, the Jewish pogroms uh, in 1881, that many Jewish people began uh, emigrating to the United States. Herzl was a guy who said, we need to have, the only way that the Jewish people are going to be safe is if they have their own country. We must have their, uh, our own country. And so he began arguing um, and seeking the support 
of Western leaders, guys like Arthur Balfour and uh, various others, you know, could you, would you support us in our claim for a Jewish homeland? Now, at the idea of a Jewish homeland, of a proposed Jewish country, there were three expressions of it. There's, first of all, the idea of a national home. And that, that idea, those Jews who believed in just having a national home, they weren't anchored to any particular bit of geography. They were people who were willing to establish um, a national home. If the United States had said, yes, you can, you can take half of California, they would have said fine. If um, they could have colonized you know, uh, some, some bit of jungle in the Amazon, they would have done it, it meaning they weren't anchored to um, any particular place in the Middle East, to what we call modern-day Israel. Then there was another group of Jews who believed in a spiritual home. This tended to be the Orthodox Jews, the very religious Jews, who believed in the promised land. And that meant they were thinking of specific geography. They were talking about that land that was given to Abraham, which isn't really clearly defined, but they believed that that, that land belonged to him, them. That was their spiritual home that they should occupy. And then there was the Zionist state. And the Zionists tended to be mostly secular, not religious. They were, though, although they were very happy to use those um, religious Jews, and they're happy to use the idea of a promised land because it gave spiritual power to their idea of creating a state. And that Zionist state, it was those people who believed in the creation of the Zionist state that won out. And, um, and of course, that state was created in, in 1948. And it was created in 1948 because, again, the idea of a, of a Jewish national home uh, was largely birthed after the pogroms, after the persecutions of the late 19th century. That's when Theodore Herzl began pushing this idea. But it didn't really get widespread Western support, support from Western governments, until after the Holocaust. And after the Holocaust, the guilt of Western nations that had participated in this was such that they lent their support to Israel and the creation of the, uh, the state of Israel in 1948. And that brings us back to where we began. It is for that reason that the Palestinians want to attack the Holocaust narrative. They want to minimize it. They want to dismiss it as nonsense or, uh, in order to rob Israel of its moral power. Next question. Well, Larry, didn't the Jews expel 700,000 Muslims when they established the state of Israel in 1948. Yeah, this is uh, this is actually very important in my in my opinion because I don't want to be guilty of presenting Israel as uh, as blameless and all this. They absolutely are not. What you're referring to is the uh, is what is known as the Nakba. Um, it's what the Palestinians call the Nakba, and the Nakba means the catastrophe, the catastrophe, and uh, and that has its basis in in a massacre that took place that's called the Deir Yassin Massacre, a massacre of a village, which I, I'll, I'll perhaps talk about um, again in a few minutes. But um, the Nakba, as the, as the state of Israel was coming into being, many Palestinians fled the, the territory that the Israelis were occupying. And it was roughly 700,000 of them. However, what I'm not hearing anybody who's pushing that narrative say is that the opposite was also true. There was persecution of Jews who occupied uh, land in many Arab nations in places like what was then Transjordan, now Jordan, Syria, uh, Lebanon, um, Egypt. Uh, these, were, um, these were Jews who were driven out of, out of their homes, roughly 500,000 of them, so almost an equal number of people who began migrating away from the Jews to Arab um, areas and Jews away from Arab areas uh, to, to what is now Israel. So, so it moved in both directions, and there was persecution on the part of both, but the persecution was real. Um, I've heard people say this before, and it, it, it's a great question. Um, do you believe that the Jews are God's chosen people? You know, I might lose a lot of people on this, on my answer to this. My answer is no. 
Do I believe that the Jews are God's chosen people? No, I don't believe that. I, the reason I support um, Israel in this, by and large, is because um, they're a democratic society surrounded by uh, uh, overwhelming numbers of Arabs who want to annihilate them, who have stated openly they want to wipe Israel from the face of them. I mean, look at, look at what the Ayatollah tweets. Death to Israel, death to America. I mean, he tweets it, for heaven's sake. You talk about what, where, when is Linda Yaccarino and her lefty geeks censoring these types exactly. on X, exactly. on Twitter? Yep. You go on there and say something about... Uh, transgenderism or whatever. Look at my Twitter. My own Twitter is being choked big time because I do say these things. I totally goes on there and says all kinds of anti-Semitic things and uh, calls for the extermination of the Jewish people, as have uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, Hezbollah, various others calling for this. Um, r remind me the, the question again. Gone out of my head. Um, it was, do you believe the Jews oh, are yes. God's chosen people? But I do not believe that they're God's chosen people in the sense that people mean it for this reason. Because I am a, um, you know, I believe that God's chosen people, I, listen, I adhere to what is known as covenant or reform theology. Covenant or reform theology. I am not a dispensationalist. It doesn't mean that I don't have, I don't agree in some measure with dispensational um, theology, but I believe very strongly that that the gospel was seeking to annihilate, the gospel of Jesus Christ was seeking to annihilate that kind of thinking. Jesus came along and there are people who, who um, there were those Jewish people who claimed they were saved by virtue of the fact that they were Jews. And Jesus said, no, 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 <laughs> no, you're not. And the gospel of John Chapter 1, verse 13 says this. He's speaking of those who are children of God. And then it says, who are born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. What John is saying right there is you're, you're spiritually reborn. Uh, you become a Christian not because of your blood, meaning, meaning as a result of your race. Your ethnicity does not save you. You will not stand before the throne and say, but I'm a Jew. That didn't get you in. That didn't get you in. Nor of the will of the flesh, meaning your own human efforts. Your own human efforts do not save you. You are not saved by virtue of the fact that you, you have really done a lot of good things. That's not what saves you, nor of the will of man. Um, and a lot of us are, are very familiar with this. That's who your daddy is. I get in because of the will of man, because I, how many times I used to sit on an admissions committee for an, uh, an elite institution. Who your daddy was mattered. It did. If you didn't have, if you didn't have an influential, influential parents or influential advocates or somebody who had given a lot of money to that institution, your test scores had better be stellar. But if somebody had given a couple of hundred thousand dollars to the institution and their test scores were low, they're getting in. They are getting in. That's, we all know that that's the way the world works. That is the way the real world works. But John is here saying that's not where the spiritual world works. Doesn't work that way there. Doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter who your daddy is. It does not matter um, what your ethnicity is. Who are those who are saved? Who are those who are the seed of Abraham, says Paul? Those who have believed those who have believed become heirs to the promise of Abraham. This is what we're told in Galatians. So in the Old Testament, God's people were, were the Jews. But in the, in, in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, it, is, it, it, it carries a, a strong spiritual meaning. God's people, the ecclesia, the assembly, uh, those are, who are God's people are those people who have believed in him. And you see Jesus saying this also, not just John here saying it, but there are those Jews who in arguing with Jesus say, ah, but we believe in Moses. And Jesus replies and says, no, no, if you believed in Moses, you believe in me. Because Moses spoke of me, he says, but you reject him and you reject me. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're not, you're not God's chosen people. You're not. 
That's the reality of Scripture. So I do not agree with those evangelicals who believe that the United States, no matter what, has to be on the side of Israel. And by the way, Israel is a secular state, and I've been there. And they kind of laugh behind their hands at those, those evangelicals who believe that. They're happy to make use of you. They're happy to make money off of you. But they don't agree with you. They don't, they don't think that's true at all. And so I don't think there's two means of salvation. One of them is you believe in Jesus Christ, and the other is you get in just because your ethnicity is that you're Jewish, and thus you get in anyway. Nope, it's all the same. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So he makes it very clear, the only way to salvation is through him. If you don't believe in him, it does not matter what your ethnicity is. Doesn't matter. Next question. Uh, you touched on this earlier. Um, what role does Islam play in this conflict? Well, I, I did talk about that a lot in the previous um, podcast, but it's worth mentioning again. Surah, from this little book right here, the Quran. I think I have another copy of it sitting up here. You have another Quran right here. Surah 839 reads, And fight them, that is the unbelievers, fight them until there is no fitna, meaning uh, worship of anything other than Allah. Fight them until there's no fitna and until the religion, all of it, is for Allah. This is the mission statement of every true Muslim. Does it mean that all Muslims read the Quran or endeavor to, to fulfill this? But those people, as I have said, who are um, we call radical Muslims, they're not radicals. They're Orthodox Muslims. They're the ones who take this book really seriously. And this, this, this book and the Hadith and the life of Muhammad, which every Muslim is supposed to model themselves after, that says that, that non-Jews are to be terrorized, terrorized, until all is for Allah, they must either, unbelievers, must um, convert, pay a tax, or die. Those are the only three options for unbelievers. This is the infidels. I couldn't think of that word last week. The, uh, the infidels must convert, pay a tax, or die. Those are the only three options. And fight them until all, is, all of the world is for Allah. This is what they believe. Even when the Arabs uh, speak of coexistence with the Jews in the Middle East. What they mean by that is under, quote, the protection of Islam. And that means that anybody who isn't Muslim must still yield and live under Muslim rule and pay the jizya, the tax. They have to pay the tax. And they have to acknowledge uh, that they are second-class citizens. We keep talking about apartheid. There are those who want to say that, that Israel is enforcing a kind of apartheid. You want to know what apartheid is? It is to be a, it is to be a non-Muslim in a Muslim country. You idiots who are supporting the Muslim countries in this, you name for me, as I said in a debate on CNN with a, um, with a Muslim woman who was arguing that Muslims believe in free speech. Where? Name for me an Islamic state that is free, that is democratic. Name for me a Muslim state that believes in free speech, that believes in freedom of religion. Do you know that you will hear the call to prayer in the UK? Absolutely disgusting. I do not want to hear, I do not want to hear that crap. I don't want, I don't want to hear that. The Muzin, you know, shouting the, the call to prayer in Western countries. Do that in your Muslim nations. Don't do that crap in my country. I don't want it. My country wasn't founded on that. Believe in that. But that's what's happening in the West. How many church bells ring in Muslim nations? Zero. Zero. If you are a non-Muslim in a Muslim nation, you are absolutely persecuted. According to the Global Terrorism Index, there's been a five-fold increase in fatalities from terrorist attacks since 9-11. Four groups are responsible for most of these. All of them are Muslim. And as I've pointed out on... Uh, in articles and published articles and on social media. What did 9-11, the USS Cole, the Chew Bomber, the 9-11, um, the 7-7 Subway Bombers, 
uh, Charlie Ebdo, the uh, hyper cache, uh, hyper cashier, um, um, kosher supermarket, um, Toulouse, the Nice uh, truck attack, um, the uh, Stockholm truck attack, Westminster Bridge. What do all of these things have in common? Amish, Presbyterians, Jews? They all have Muslims in common. Muslims. All of those terrorist attacks were perpetrated by Muslims. And there are those of you who will say to me, who will say, well, they don't represent uh, Islam. Yeah, they do. Yes, they do. Because they take this book seriously. They took it very seriously. This book, this book absolutely supports what they're doing. And I noticed a seminary professor yesterday who I've offered, if he's paying attention, I've offered to, to debate him. Uh, his name does not immediately come to my mind. I'll see if I can find him right here. But I've offered to debate this fellow. He posted yesterday, his name is Scott. And uh, pardon me, Scott, I'm not sure I'm saying your, your name correctly. Scott, Scott Aniel. Scott Aniel, he is a seminary professor, and he tweeted this, 70 million innocent lives murdered, thousands of women raped, children molested, illegitimate children left to fend for themselves, physical mutilation, secularism? No. All done in the name of Christ during Christendom. Secularism is horrible, but Christendom is no better. Now, this is monumental ignorance because... Jesus himself said in John 16, there would be those who would kill in his name. There would be those who would say they are rendering service to Christ when they killed somebody. But it's not a Christian act because Jesus didn't command that we do that. So anybody who's doing that, those aren't Christian acts. I don't have a Bible sitting up here, but if I did, I'd hold it up and say, this book doesn't justify that behavior. This book does. This book does. So any Christian who is, is terrorizing people, if there, were, if there were, and there aren't, but if there were Christian suicide bombers, I would say to you that those individuals are acting in a way that is, that is in conflict with what Jesus taught. Not so for Islam. Not so for Islam. It's perfectly consistent with the teachings of Allah. It's perfectly consistent with the Quran. A Pew Research survey found that only 57% of Muslims have a negative view of Al-Qaeda and only 51% have a negative view of the Taliban. Think about that. What would, what would they have to do? What would, what would um, the, the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban have to do to lose the support of that the um, 43 and 49% there. Go and behead some people, kidnap them, rape them. Well, they're already doing that. <laughs> so, I mean, again, that's an astonishing statistic. After Charlie Hebdo, BBC did a poll in Britain of Muslims in, in Britain to see how many of them agreed or disagreed with the Charlie Hebdo attacks committed again by, um, by Muslims, as was the, um, the Bataclan. And they, they put out this very cheery report that said um, something like, overwhelming majority of Muslims opposed to Charlie Hebdo. Then I went and read the article, and the article said that 27% of British Muslims were, quote, sympathetic with the Charlie Hebdo attacks. 27%. So that means that one in four, which is roughly 700,000 Muslims in London alone, 700,000 Muslims were sympathetic with the Charlie Hebdo attacks. One in four people, one in four Muslims were sympathetic with a terrorist attack. That's a lot of potential terrorists living in your midst. Imagine, do you think BBC, do you think BBC would, if 27% of Christians were sympathetic with abortion clinic bombings, do you think BBC would put out a headline that said, overwhelming majority of Christians opposed to abortion clinic? But no, they would say, shocking poll shows that we have a lot of potential terrorists among Christians. Next question. Uh, next question is, do you think Israel is totally innocent in this war? Didn't Menachem Begin do some terrible things? 
A uh, great question. My answer is no. I do not believe that Israel's been totally innocent. Menachem Begin, and now I'm going to upset some other people here. Uh, Menachem Begin, I remember him from, say, when I was in middle school and high school. If there was a Mount Rushmore for Israel, Menachem Begin would be on it. He is, he is one of, along with um, Ben Gurion, he is, and uh, Golda Meir, he is. He is one of those George Washington kind of figures in the founding of Israel. He is an enormously influential figure, prime minister, played a huge role in the founding of Israel. I, I, I think Menachem Begin is going to shock some people. I think he was a terrorist. Menachem Begin was a terrorist. Nobody wants to speak of him like that. I just watched a um, documentary about him that was just lavished him with praise. Menachem Begin blew up the, the King David Hotel in Israel in, I think, 1946. Um, and he did it because he believed that terrorism was the most effective way to drive the British out. He killed loads of British people, loads of Arabs, loads of Jews in that attack and blowing up that, that hotel. And by the way, many Jews did not agree with him when he did that. He also, the aforementioned um, uh, Dear uh, Yassin massacre. This was an Arab village that had established peace with the Jews. He was all for it. They went in and they annihilated the population of that village. He was for it. He thought that was a good thing to do. I personally do not think that's true. So no, Menachem Begin used the very tactics that Hamas is using right now. Now we're running out of time here, so I just want to say this. Make sure um, that you can watch this again. It'll be posted on the YouTube channel. It'll be, it's also posted on Twitter. Be sure to subscribe to the email list. Be sure to subscribe to that because then we can notify you. It's been great to be with you this morning. I'll try to drop into the comments as I'm able and respond to some of the things that are going on there. But it's been great to be with you on Ideas Have Consequences this morning. You guys take care.